So hi everyone, I'm uh, Thomas Nieten from Med Norway, and uh, thanks again for being invited to 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 talk um, in this workshop. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about what we do um, in terms of now casting on our public weather app YR. And uh, so I'm a I'm a scientist working in the um, development center for weather forecasting at Met in Norway, uh, which is the division that's responsible for. Uh, both research and development of weather forecast products, uh, as well as the day-to-day -day operational activities. And so on this slide, I've also included some of my other colleagues at MAPS who have contributed to, to the work that I will um, uh, present today. Um, so basically, uh, this presentation will cover four things. Um, first, I'll give a quick introduction to YR. Um, and, um, then I'll talk a little bit about how our precipitation outcast that we have uh, built um, on, on YR, how that works. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about some ongoing developments that we're doing to improve this, this um, product. And then in the end, I'll give some perspectives on, on how we see the products developing in, into the future. Um, yeah, so briefly, um, YR is basically Met's uh, main channel for disseminating uh, public weather forecasts, and uh, and this app is is um, developed uh, in collaboration between us um, and and uh, the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, which is a government-owned media organization in Norway. And so basically, we deliver the data, uh, and uh, and NRK um, who are um, experts at, uh, at presenting information. Uh, they're doing the, the visualization um, and also doing the work to, to, to ensure that our end users understand, you know, understand our forecast. Uh, so, of course, our focus is, is the Nordic uh, countries, uh, but, we, but we have a, um, EU, EU has global uh, coverage and, and we actually have a, lot of, a large number of users from, from all over the world. Um, uh, so we have about 10 million um, users who use EU on a weekly basis, and and this large, this very large user base has been pretty important for us um, in, in the development of our products uh, because all these users generate feedback on 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 our products, which we then try and integrate and uh, and, and improve improve our products. And since about 2014, um, the um, the, the main forecasts on YR are, are, are fully automated. Um, um, the exception is, is weather warnings. These are uh, produced by uh, meteorologists uh, on duty. Um, yeah. And so because our forecasts are automated, um, machine learning is, is a very important component of our uh, forecasting system. So any kind of weakness we have in our product, uh, if, the, if there's some issue, some systematic errors or, or something like that, we basically have to use machine learning to to uh, fix it. Um, and and basically to to help us do that, um, we we try and integrate a lot of different data sources, um, both observation data sources and and physical uh, models, NWP models. So on the observation side, we use, of course, conventional weather stations um, and, and radar. Uh, but increasingly, we're starting to use more crowdsourced weather uh, data. One example is uh, personal weather stations. Um, the, and this is, uh, these are weather stations that private, private people buy in the store and, and put them up in their backyard. And we, we are able to get a hold of this data. And this kind of data source has really exploded in the last five to 10 years. Uh, we use uh, one company called NetAdmo, uh, which uh, has a lot of stations in, in the Nordics uh, that, that we have access to. And um, we're also using web, web cameras uh, and well, increasingly trying to, to look at more, more data sources too. Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so all of this data is, is um, all of this data we take and integrate uh, in, in sort of near real time and, and, and update our forecast uh, very frequently. Um, 
uh, as as new data arrives, we we, we um, yeah we 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 try and integrate it, and then this is kind of where uh, we call it post processing. But it, this is where we have a lot of machine learning models that that they use all these uh, data sources um, because that basically our goal is to always give the user the the, the most up to date forecast and or the best forecast at, at any given at any given time. Uh, all right. So on um, uh, why are we we provide weather forecasts in in a variety of um, on a variety of time scales. Everything from a now casting, which is um, what what we define as the next ninety minutes, uh, to ten day long range forecasts. And and these forecasts are provided in many different forms, including tables, graphs, and, and maps. And you know, point here is that all these products have undergone a lot of user testing. Um, and so they've they've tested the products on on I mean they go they go out in parks and and and, and ask people what well, we think of this product does do you understand it and, and so forth and they, they even bring people into the studio to do testing on the products um, on their mobile phone so so you, user input is very very important here in in uh, in designing at least the visualization of the, of the of the forecast okay. Um, so now I'll switch over a bit, start talking a bit more about the 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 the, the nowcast. Um, so on why are we have a, um, a a ninety minute precipitation nowcast that we launched in two thousand sixteen, so about five years ago, and it's, it's a very popular product. I think um, I think that um, you know people are more and more interested in in just in, in the now casting time scale, uh, this has been as a big a focus for us before for 2016. But in the last years, um, that now casting is, is being quite important to us. Uh, this product um, is produced, it's based on radar, uh, on recent radar images. Um, and it's updated every five minutes, which is the frequency of how, which is how often we run the radar scans in Norway. Um, this product is five minute time resolution and, and we produce a forecast on a, a one kilometer grid. Uh, we have the nowcast is available in several different forms to the user um, and each kind of form provides different information. So we have a map um, which um, yeah, gives the user sort of an understanding of the overall situation. We have a, also a time series plot, um, which uh, which is very useful for making time sensitive decisions. So, uh, if if you want to know whether there's a, a break between two rain rain bands, you can go outside. But this visualization will give you that. And then finally, we have a, a sort of a. We also provide the now cast in a one hour aggregation form. So for them in this case, 0 0.7 millimeters <clears throat> for the next hour. Uh, and that kind of helps the user assess the overall severity of, uh, of the situation. And each of these forms have different um, processing applied to them. They're, they're kind of actually different forecast um, because what makes sense on the map might not make sense in a time series. Mm, which also might not make sense in a one hour aggregation. So we really have to treat these differently um, because you're, you're using these products to make different types of situations essentially and then we need to optimize them for that um, in, in very different ways. Uh, okay, so how does this nowcast actually work? Um, so we use a commonly used um, image processing technique called optical flow, which uh, used when you take two radar images, you can detect the motion between them. Um, and this produces a vector field that you see in this um, map here. Um, and then together with the, um, the starting state, so the actual precipitation amount from the radar, you can then um, advect uh, affect this precipitation field forward in time uh, along the streamlines. Um, 
So this is quite a simple method, of course, but it generally works quite well. Uh, we, with this method, of course, we can't um, we can't really generate any new precipitation um, uh, or or decay. Uh, we can't really model growth and decay of cells, which is the limitation of the method. But um, uh, yeah, that's just the way this uh, method works. Um, and then the last step then, after we have this advection, we, we apply a um, spatial smoothing filter. <clears throat> so you can kind of see, um, here's the original field. And here's the um, smooth field. And um, we apply the smoothing field filter uh, basically to improve the, um, the accuracy of the, um, the, the time series. Um, Let's see here. So um, the way uh, <clears throat> sorry the way this uh, filter works is you, you take a neighborhood uh, around each grid point and <clears throat> compute the median of this neighborhood, and this um, neighborhood just keeps growing uh, with lead, lead time. Um, and um, yeah, and this is very important in this time series graph. So without this, the, this time series graph will just keep jumping from one update to the net, next. So it makes it a lot more robust. Um, uh, yeah, so <clears throat> and on, on, on the right here, we can just, uh, here I've done an evaluation of the product against um, uh, ground-based weather stations. And uh, so the original, uh, optical flow algorithm is in green, and then, then the width is smooth against the blue. So you can see we increases the equitable threat scores. You can see it uh, is improved by 5%. <clears throat> and then um, um, in red here, we have the, the NWP model. So you can see we get the, the <clears throat> this basically extends the, um, the value of the now cast compared to the NWP for for a bit further. Um, so it's a very important part of our um, system. Let's see here, one second. <clears throat> All right, so, um, yeah, but uh, of course, uh, now casting in Norway, it's not without any, cha without challenges, of course. Now, Norway is quite mountainous. And the estimating precipitation is quite difficult. Um, so one of the challenges is that the radar coverage in Norway is not very um, homogeneous. <clears throat> and um, uh, on the left here we have um, here's a comparison of uh, three months uh, rain totals from the radar, and on the right is the same three months from the NWP model. Um, and so we can see here <clears throat> in this three months accumulation, there, there's some, um, what we know from verification that the NWP climatology is quite accurate or reasonably accurate. So we know the three months total from the NWP is quite, quite okay. But you can see that the radar, <clears throat> um, then there's a mismatch here. And, um, and this has to do with, um, basically biases in, in, in the radar measurements. Uh, uh, areas close to the radar are measuring more accurately than further away from the radar. And basically we don't, we under, we, in many areas we underestimate the radar amount, which means that the three months totals are, are, um, are, are, are not uh, high enough. And so, so yeah, basically the, it's not very homogeneous. And then we also have these blocked areas, which is these uh, these gray areas or, or blocking areas, where we don't where the radar doesn't see um, see precipitation at all. So we have a very inhomogeneous um, field that we have to work with in in outcast, which is quite makes it challenging. Um, another challenge we have, um, uh, which is kind of interesting, is that. Uh, in some areas, where the, especially where the radar shoots uh, too high, like it doesn't see, um, uh, it, the beam doesn't, isn't close enough to the ground, uh, you can have a situation where 
uh, the, the radar measures rain. Uh, in this, so in this map, it's the shaded area. Uh, it measures, let's say, up to 0 0.5 millimeters per hour. Uh, but then the um, stations on the ground aren't, me aren't measuring anything. So it's, it's completely dry on the ground. And here, these these um, these circles here are ground stations. These are the, the personal weather stations that I was talking about earlier. So we have quite good coverage of those. And <clears throat> you see, in this case, uh, they're not measuring any precipitation, with it, except there's a couple here that have some kind of uh, um, malfunction in, in the station. But those, but in general, you can see there's no uh, precip on the ground. So this generates a lot of false alarm. Well, not a lot, but it, it does happen. Uh, and so you can get this time series here on the top left that uh, gives you the idea that it's raining outside, but but it really is there is no rain reaching the ground. Uh, I've even I'll admit even I've even made that mistake once where I put on rain gear and headed outside and found out it was dry. So this is a, a big problem for us. Well, not big, but it's one of many issues and. Um, um, yeah, basically it reduces people's sort of confidence in our product, right? They just want to look on the phone and then just just go outside and 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 and, and trust it. Um, uh, and another problem, and well, again, not a major problem, but it does happen every now and then that that the radars have some kind of malfunction where we get some kind of bizarre. Uh, um, uh, yeah, radar field. Uh, here's the Swedish radar that's having some issues. And because our forecasts are fully automated, um, this kind of stuff will enter into our forecast and, and um, uh, yeah, cause some interesting uh, decisions to be made by the end users. So we, we really, we can't really, yeah, we have to work quite hard to um, to make sure that these kind of errors don't enter our, our forecast. Um, uh, yeah, they're rare, but they still still happen. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's go. Here we go. Uh, slide 14. Yeah. Um, the, uh, and then another challenge is, of course, that sometimes radars go down for planned or unplanned maintenance. That's just way of life. Here's an example where we have on the west coast of Norway, we have three, um, I circled three radars here, and then all of a sudden one of the radars is missing. And this affects the precipitation field here. Um, now you could argue, okay, we still have, um, you know, we still have coverage with the two radars. We still cover the same area, but you can see that uh, realistically, we don't actually have any, we don't really observe precipitation in, in between these two radars. And and this is a problem because then our end users, uh, well, our, our product isn't very good. Um, so what we do on YR is we just temporarily mask out. We basically block this whole area and say we don't, we can't give you a forecast today uh, or an outcast. And uh, this is unfortunate, but but it is important because we don't really want our users to make decisions based on our product. And in this case, it would be better that they just not have a product um, yeah um, and this does actually happen recently often the, yeah radars do need to be maintained and, and so forth so yeah this is something that we struggle a little bit with uh, okay so those are some challenges but we also have work like I'm just gonna mention a little bit how we actually deal with with uh, these challenges um, um, so one one of the things we do is uh, I mentioned earlier. I showed you the comparison between the NWP aggregation and the radar aggregation, and we can use this information to try and uh, adjust the radar. So, for example, here we have a let's just take this point, the yellow point here, a yellow circle, and um, if we extract the um, the, the NWP uh, quantiles from three months history and, and the radar and plot them against each other, the sorted values. You can see that for this point, uh, the, the radar isn't measuring, the, 
it's not measuring anything about five millimeters per hour, even though the NWP model has much higher uh, values uh, climatologically. So of course we, we know that NWP can't always place precipitation in the right spot, but sort of on a three months um, um, climatology, then then it is uh, yeah quite okay. So in this case, uh, essentially, uh, we we have this yeah a quantile map that we can then apply to the radar images if you wanted to. So on the right here, I have a verification. In, uh, for our uh, now cast, our one hour now cast in red. Uh, this is again the equitable threat score, uh, so higher values are better. Um, and this is down at the, the ground station, not, not against the radar, but against ground station. And if you also evaluate the verifying radar, so uh, if you take the radar images that you would have, if you had them available ahead of time, which you don't, but let's say if you did, um, this is essentially the quality of the radar field, and you can see, you know, it's not the radar isn't perfect. So, um, uh, so essentially, the blue line represents what is the best possible now cast we could do using radar, and we have the red line. So the difference between the red line and the blue line is kind of um, what, what is kind of the the the, the um, yeah, what's our capacity for improving our product? You can't really ever beat the blue line in this case, because you can't. If you, I mean, if you're using radar, you, you can't do better than what it measures itself. Um, so in some ways, this is kind of a, a lid, a roof of, of how much better we can can make our forecast with using raw radar. If you apply this quantile map uh, everywhere in Norway. Uh, then you can sort of, in a, in a sense, lift this roof, right? Um, so, so this dashed line shows you the quality of the radar after you've applied the correction. So you can see now all of a sudden you, uh, you, can, you can do quite a lot more. Um, and consequently, if you then apply it to the now cast, you also improve. So you can see that just this simple correction of the radar gives you more uh, added value than you than you kind of can with just improving the optical flow algorithm. Uh, here's another thing we're doing: we're looking at doing a real time correction of the radar. And here's a radar a precipitation band that blew through southern Norway, and and verifying or, or the, together with the net ammo weather stations. And uh, what we can do here is we can do a the radar, there's a mismatch between radar and the measuring stations that we can correct in real time. And so if you, for example, pick a, a spot here with this um, yellow circle, you can see the difference between uh, what the radar is measuring and what the net ammo is measuring. So in this case, we're severely underestimating precipitation from the radar, uh, right? Because uh, the red line is much higher than the yellow line. Now, if you go to another point, then maybe they're, they're more equal. And so if you then take these and apply this correction in real time uh, as, as the weather is happening, uh, you can basically get a corrected radar map. So on the left is a raw, raw radar field, and on the right is the same field, but corrected to, to fit more with what the ground stations are seeing. So you can see here that we're adding a lot of uh, magnitude in, in this more, more heavy precipitation uh, cell. And so if you do this kind of correction, then we can give it to the optical flow and it can, it can use a much better starting field, which will give us a better product. Uh, yeah, so that's basically what we're working on now. I, lastly, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about some strategies for how we might go about improving this now casting product. And we're quite interested in what what you guys are uh, doing in this workshop, because um, we think some of those methods could be could be relevant for us. Um, now, the four strategies we are thinking of, uh, and they're basically for machine learning. You, you need uh, good input predictors. You need good uh, target um, target fields, which is what you're training towards. Uh, you need good machine learning models, and you need to work with the end users. So, to improve the predictor. Uh, we're kind of looking at uh, not just using radar as an input predictor, but also other data such as NWP model output. So as was mentioned earlier, NWP models can really 
accurately place cells in real time, but they they do have a lot of information about cell lifetimes and capacity. So we think there's a lot of int uh, important data buried in the end of a P model that we can still use in an outcasting sense, even though you wouldn't really want to use NWP for an outcasting itself, there's relevant information that we can use um, together with radar. And we have a lot of data. Uh, uh, we have one and a half petabytes of NWP data on disk. So if you want to do a very, uh, if you want to do the machine learning on a large scale, there's a lot of, lot of data available. <laughs> Um, so then with the targets, uh, again, you need something to train the machine learning model towards. Um, if you just use radar, I don't, we kind of, at least in Norway, we don't think you can get all that far because uh, the radar has so many um, biases. So we really think you need to make an, uh, sort, of a, an, um, sort of a high resolution gridded analysis or like a, a truth that's based on radar in situ weather observations, maybe even NWP. And we've done some work on that to, to, to create these kind of continuous uh, fields um, that com basically combines radar and NWP and produces a field that's more accurate. So in terms of uh, machine learning models, and I'm kind of looking forward to hearing more about this later in the, uh, in the workshop. Um, um, we think that by use, by say switching from something like optical flow to to a more, more um, trained and supervised uh, model, you, you're able to do uh, a lot of things that we that, that we can't do today. Like um, for example, instead of just a, like today's system uh, relies on detecting an event uh, a cell, um, whereas machine learning models can potentially uh, anticipate. Uh, new cells uh, spawning uh, and, and decaying. So that's sort of the opportunity there. Um, whatever method you use, you, you, you kind of have to take into account the, the fact that the, the, the rate of coverage is, is non-homogeneous, that there are many blocked areas. And, and this is deal, dealing with this kind of issue is something, something that the model has to take into account. And then finally, um, yeah. We also need to work with the users. How do users make decisions? What, what are suitable loss functions that represent how they make decisions? Um, what are sort of acceptable false alarm rates? If we have a push notification on our app that, OK, there's a heavy, heavy uh, precipitation cell coming, we, well, what kind of uh, false alarm rates can we, can we accept? And we don't think it, you can have all that many false alarms before people start turning it off. So it is very important that, that it is quite accurate, otherwise I don't think it's all that useful. Um, um, so here's an example where you have a pretty heavy precipitation cell showing up on radar uh, on the left here, and uh, you know it's about to come. What, what, what kind of pres information can we give our end users um, that about what's happening in the next hour? So here's basically we had almost 40 millimeters in one hour, uh, which is for Norway quite, quite long. Um, but, but kind of thinking about how the end users will make decision, I think is a very important aspect of how we improve, improve the products. So I'm out of time and I uh, just got to the end. So uh, thanks again for the invitation.